Hello everyone, thanks for coming. Um, it looks like I have a massive audience because I can see the far balcony uh, through the window, so it's quite <laughs> off-putting. But anyway, um, my talk probably will be a bit drier than Kim's. But don't worry, the pawn's up next, so just hold out for 10 minutes and, <laughs> and we'll get there. Um, so, what I'm talking about is film. And when Kim first, and Keck first kind of told me about tonight's session, I thought I'd take a literary talk about film. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the history of photography and then how that kind of led on to... Cool. So, uh, and my notes are on this recycled paper, so it's very hard to read. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um... No thanks. <laughs> yeah. It's a communal effort. Um, so anyway, uh, energy from the sun comes to the earth in visible and invisible portions of the electromagnetic <laughs> spectrum. Uh, the, vis the visible energy we call light. Um, so from very early on it was noted that certain chemicals reacted when exposed to light. One of these is silver. Um, so basically it's the energy in each photon of light causes chemical change in photographic detectors that are coated on film. This process is called photochemistry, whereby submicron sized grains of silver halide crystals undergo a chemical change when exposed to various forms of the electromagnetic radiation. That also includes, uh, that goes beyond the visible spectrum as well, including x-rays and infrared. Um, silver halide grains are manufactured by containing, combining silver nitrate with halide salts, chlorine, bromide and iodine. After exposure, a latent image is formed that remains invisible until chemically processed. So, oh, whoops. Uh, anyway, in, 19, in 1760, the possibility of new scientific frontier was suggested by the French writer Charles de Fain de la Roche. So in his book, Jaifantia, a traveller in the African desert is transported by whirlwind to a land whose inhabitants are able to fix the images made by light rays. He describes how using a most subtle matter, very vicious and proper to harden and dry, coated on canvas, these images are impressed on the, in the twinkle of an eye, after which the canvas is dried in a dark place for an hour. Once dry, the pictures cannot be imitated by art or damaged by time. So, what is interesting about this is this was in 1760. Um, and, in fact, a German... But the first photograph was not taken until 1823. So, there was a German photo, photo historian called Helmut Gernstein, who... Sorry, this is quite a... Pretty, um, who points out that the necessary optical instruments and photochemical means existed as early as 1725. The circumstance of pho photography was not invented earlier remains the greatest mystery in its history, which is quite interesting. Um, so, very early on, uh, a few centuries before, there was a camera obscura, which was a drawing device whereby a hole in a wall could act as a lens and, tra and project an image of the outside world onto a wall. Um, this was also a drawing device, which was quite common. Um, for architectural drawing and drafting and things like that. So, the earliest fixed photographic image was achieved in 1826 by Joseph Nisphor Nieps. This is him here. Um, and this is the first photographic image, which was on a silver plate, which I'll talk about a bit later. But it's quite interesting, and it's quite hard to see, but a reproduction enhanced version looks like that. So, you can kind of see, oops, there we go, uh, it's, a vin it's a picture from a window in his house, which was in Burgundy in France, and the exposure I think was about 12 hours, so the sensitivity of the silver was quite low, so that's why you see kind of double shadows and the sun seems to go from both directions. Anyway, uh, in 1840, 1839, this guy, uh, De Gea, <laughs> it, um, announced to the world the first um, process that was kind of commercially available, which he called the daguerreotype. Um, and that was a photo he took. The exposure was probably a few minutes. Um, so I might just skip that for a second. So anyway, the daguerreotype, announced in 1939 in Paris by De Gea, 
and he had been researching with Nieps, but Nieps died, so he just kind of took on the thing. So basically what it is is, and you'll see in this image, it is a sheet of copper thinly plated with silver, and then the silver is polished. The sheet is then placed in an iodine chamber, and the rising vapors cause a chemical reaction with the silver to produce silver iodine, which is light sensitive. Um, it's transferred to a light proof holder, then it's exposed, it was projected through a camera obscure at the time, for, you know, up to as long as a few hours. Um, then it was developed by placing a heated dish of mercury to produce an image of silver mercury and it was later fixed with sodium theosulfide and often toned in gold chloride for permits. So we can see examples of them here. Um, so what they actually are is it's a negative image but because it's on a piece of silver which acts as a mirror, the light reflects back. So that's why it was called a mirror with a memory and if you've if anyone's seen them and you they're quite interesting objects and you have to kind of play with the reflection of the light so you can see the positive image so um, in England in uh, 1840 this gentleman uh, William Henry Fox Talbot created a process of paper negatives um, which he patented in 1841 so he called it a calotype and kalos coming from the Greek word for beautiful type is coming from image. So basically what was was similar thing which was silver nitrate brushed onto a piece of paper then dried. Um, this was floated on potassium iodine to create silver iodine which is light sensitive. Afterwards it was um, swabbed with a solution of silver nitrate with acetic and gallic acids which made it full light sensitive. So he had a negative process which is what we have adopted today where it's paper negative and then you need to do a print of the negative to get the positive image. Um, and it was a salt paper print at the time, which is what he invented, and it was a similar kind of process whereby you submerge a piece of paper in you know, silver nitrate and process it out. Um, in 1857, this was superseded 1851 this is superseded by a process called wet plate collodion photography which was collodion which is a chemical chemically a cellulose nitrate it's made from gun cotton and gun cotton is basically regular cotton soaked in nitric and sulfuric acid then dried it was then dissolved with a mixture of alcohol and ether to produce potassium iodine um, syrup like liquid was poured over a glass plate and it exposed um, while it was still damp it was then developed in a mixture of pyrogallic and acetic acid and then fixed in sodium theosulfite. Um, then next came albumin prints and this is by French photographer Eugene Atje and there was recently an exhibition of his work, his original prints at the art gallery. This was in the 1920s but album prints were around about the 1880s. So it was basically albumin is egg white. So what it was was the paper was floated on a solution of egg white mixed with salt, um, which is sodium chloride. After drying, it was sensitized in a solution of so silver nitrate. So the salt and the silver nitrate combined form light sensitive silver salts, exposed by contact printing and then printed out. Um, here's another print of Ajay's. And then we get on to, so here's a precursor to the porn. Um, then we get on to. <laughs> It's a photograph I took in Paris at the Musée d'Orsay. It's a Corbet painting called Origin of the World. Um, anyway, so then silver gel and printing was invented in 1873. Um, and it was very similar. I don't need to go into it too much. But the binder, previously the binder had been collodion. The binder was gelatin. Now gelatin is a protein extract from animal waste, bones, hoofs, horns and hides. So it's a type of glue that forms a transparent film that can repeatedly absorb and release water, which is very practical for photographic purposes. Um, so that's the negative, and that's what the positive looks like when you print it out. Um, I love the old lady there. <laughs> I'm not sure what the guy is doing, whether he's just looking or looking closer, or I don't know. Anyway or having a sniff maybe, anyway. Um, so, black and white processing. So what it is, is film is placed in a 
So after negative exposed, all the silver that is silver nitrate grains that are exposed to light um, have a chemical reaction. It's then placed in a developing solution, which is actually a reducing agent. So all the silver ions that have been um, changed are converted into silver metal. Silver ions that have undergone the chemical change develop more rapidly. The unexposed grains will remain as silver halide crystals. This is then washed in water or a stop bath and then a fixer, which removes all of the unexposed silver um, halide crystals. Um, yes, so then from there you can create a positive print. Yep, uh, let's make this the film. Um, so the main advantage of silver gel and printing over the earlier methods were it was faster, so you could the production time was quicker, so it means photographers could uh, produce more in a day, and enlargements were possible. So all of the previous uh, examples of photographic production required contact printing, so you would have to shoot a negative the same size as the print, and would be contact exposed in the sun for a few hours. So now you could shoot on smaller negatives and enlarge it, which leads on to cinema. So there was always this need for, you know, or this desire for motion. So some of the early systems, which kind of the father of this cinematography is Mae Moybridge, who he did scientific um, work where it was, he'd set up kind of a length of cameras, maybe a dozen or 20 cameras, and he'd photograph the motion of animals when viewed, all the um, photographs were put on this rotating disc, which you see there, and then viewed through a viewer, which created the you know, illusion of movement. Um, in so that uh, the year that started was kind of 1879. Um, so then, in America, you had Thomas Edison in the 1880s who started doing his kinetoscope. Uh, so it was a similar principle where it was a motion picture camera that paper negatives were exposed, you know, in motion and they were kind of personal viewing things. So the image wasn't projected. It was like a personal kind of peep show type thing that, you know, <laughs> bears the thing. And, you know, one of the earliest uses for photography was pornography, which is still always had commercial applications. So <laughs> then in France, um, the Lumiere brothers had their cinematograph, which was pretty much the same thing as Edison, but they had also created this projector, so the images could now be projected, and the date of that was 1894. Around the same time, Edison started doing the same thing. So, uh, then we'll move on to colour. <laughs> uh, the history of... It's kind of... Uh, there are two forms of colour systems with regard to light. There's additive colour and subtractive colour. So the primary colours of light are red, green and blue. When you add them together you get white light. And then subtractive version of that, when you you know take all what take away all the lights you get black. Um, and the three colour things are magenta, cyan and yellow. So early colour Colour photography existed in the form of kind of hand printing, uh, hand tinting, colour photographs, that kind of thing. But really the cinema needed something that was instantaneous. So one of the, the, actually the earliest form of colour photography was by the Lumiere brothers and it was called the Autochrome in about 1906, which I've lost the page for. But, um, Anyway, Technicolor in 1917, they created this system, it was a two-color separation system. So basically what would happen is the camera would expose two, piece, two frames of film simultaneously, one through a green filter, one through a red filter. Then you would get two black and white negatives of a different tonal contrast because of the color filter system. Then when that was projected, it would be two black and white negatives or positive would be reprojected through the colour filter and then you would get a two separation colour system. Quite primitive but also quite interesting. Um, then they came along with three, sti three strip Technicolor process which was three rolls of film inside this camera and it was through a prism so it was the same um, concept with separated by red, green and blue. Um, 
and there's this really interesting thing here. So basically at the top you have the negative as it was, it's the same frame exposed through a red filter, a green filter and a blue filter. Then that would be printed out to form this positive image. Then a dye was added to it, so you had cyan, magenta and yellow, which was a subtractive color system. And then the dyes were then imprinted onto a release print, which formed a three color image. It's quite incredible, actually. Um, so here's Jack Carter, one of the uh, early cinematographers with his big camera. And the camera's not that big, it's just a big blimp to control the noise. Some of his films were, he was very famous for doing all the Powell and Pressburger films, Black Narcissus. 947, which is one of the great films, colour cinematography, and The Red Shoes, which is similarly excellent. If you haven't seen them, you should watch them. It's, um, so then, along came the idea of, um, rather than using three strips of film, having one piece of film with three layers of colour information on it. And this is kind of a cross-section of color negative. So you can kind of see this separation here and next frame zooms in and you can see these are the three color layers. This here is the backing, that's kind of whatever, the front, oops, front. So anyway, you had kind of yellow, magenta and cyan layers of color. Uh, here we have a color negative which is something I took, sorry I didn't have a better image but I didn't have many scanned. Um, and when that's the positive version of that so the idea is you have a colour negative printed against another material that's negative um, there's other stuff I could talk about but it's probably not going to be that interesting uh, except maybe the, the change of the film supports because something which people probably know about which is kind of cellulose nitrate and the fact that it was very flammable and early on the original negatives were kind of made on paper but it was not the strongest uh, material. So then, in 1887, they developed cellulose nitrate, which was stronger, lightweight, but it was highly flammable. So, uh, and it was kind of used until the 1950s for motion picture films. Um, and you've probably all seen kind of things like uh, *Inglorious Bastards*, where you know the end where they burn the cinema because the nitrate film is very flammable. And anyway, after that came kind of acetate. Cellulose diacetate, um, which was also known as Kodak safety film because it wasn't flammable, but it was not very stable, so it had a tendency to shrink, which caused problems for archival purposes. Then came on cellulose triacetate, which was developed in the 40s and gradually became the most common for roll films, and polyester, small for sheet films like this. And oh, that's it. Any questions? <laughs>